3. I'm Marshall Shannon with Ministry Design Training, and today we have as our guest Alan Wilds, who is a generosity coach with Generis, which is a generosity firm. He's going to be presenting Step 4 of Generosity Game Plan in Action. And so, Alan, I'm so thankful to have you with us today. I know the folks who have been listening to the first three uh, webinars are looking forward to this one and the one to follow. And so take it away, would you? Yeah, thank you, Marshall. Appreciate the opportunity, as always, and your, uh, your confidence in me and in Generis to, to be a part of your ministry. Um, just wanna, we're just going to dive right in. We've been talking about a, a generosity game plan for churches, and, and how do you implement that? First of all, what does it look like, and then how do you implement it? What are the components, and what does that look like in a local church? And, and so I just, I, let's just get started. Um, we need a plan. Uh, we have plan. We plan everything. Uh, sometimes many of us plan too much, but I used to be a, a high school and college baseball coach, and before every game I would spend a long, a long period of time trying to determine, you know, what, what was our strategy going to be for tomorrow's game. A lot of that depended on the pitcher. It depended on, you know, health of some of my players and those kinds of things. Um, but I always had a plan going into the game. Now, once the game started, Oftentimes that plan would get uh, would have to be modified. I mean, you just injuries or a player just not having his not having his best game that day, a pitcher or whatever it might be. You just or the opposing team and how they were playing. You you had to you probably had to adjust it, but but it didn't keep me from having a plan going into every game, and it wasn't the same one every single game. It it, it adjusted as I went, and I coached for in high school for five years and. I had a new team every year, so my strategies would adjust based on the team and kids graduating. And, and, and I think we need a, a plan for everything in our church. And, and Marshall, uh, you know, you were a pastor. You, you encouraged all of your ministry leaders to have some type of calendar or action plan or plan or ministry plan, I'm, I'm assuming. Yes, we did each year. I mean, they they had to write it down kind of. And you want, as you're as the leader of your staff, you wanted to see, hey, what are our objectives? What are you trying to achieve this year? Is that, I mean, is that a fair statement? Yes, it is. I mean, and the people that are listening, I'm, I'm assuming you ask you if you're a senior pastor and you're listening. I'm assuming that you ask your staff to show you, you know, what, what is, what's your strategy? What's your plan for going into, into the, to a calendar year or the next 12 months or the next six months? And so, generosity should not be any different. And we, we all know that it takes money to fund ministry. And so if money is one of the drivers of ministry, then why in the world would we not have a plan to be able to have more money to be able to drive more ministry? Um, to me, it makes logic, you know, pretty, pretty logical sense to, to do that. So, but unfortunately, most churches do not have an intentional strategy for stewardship. We, we tend to just kind of let it go. Uh, we, we don't talk about it. It's the, maybe it's the, you know, the the one topic that we just, for whatever reason, we just don't talk about it. And there's a variety of reasons of why we don't. I, I don't I, I don't really have much patience for any of those reasons of why we don't, um, but I understand why some churches might not. But, but my job is to try to help leaders and staff and pastors in particular to, to feel empowered to have a game plan. And what does that look like? What we found is that people do not have a giving problem. Uh, they have a giving to your church problem. Um, yes, in 2008, did charitable giving take a hit? It certainly did. In 2009, giving was down uh, from 08. In 2010, it was down from 08, but it was up from 09. And in 11, it went up from 10. And in 12, uh, it is on track to being uh, higher than 11, rivaling the 2007 uh, charitable giving numbers. It's still less than 2007, but it's there. The giving is there. Um, so people do not have a giving problem. They have a giving to your church problem. The one thing that we have learned in the last four years is that what the biggest change in giving behaviors since 2008 has been that now the investors, and we view people who give back to God through a local church as investors. They are investing in the kingdom. Investors are more shrewd. They, they are more shrewd. There are more opportunities to give to nonprofit parachurch organizations now than ever before. And many of them are doing amazing kingdom work, and they are worthy of investment. And many people now are seeing parachurch ministries as a better investment 
than giving to their local church. And that's a problem. Um, we need a plan. Uh, we, we need a strategy to how, to how to help fix that. So five focal points of a generosity game plan. We, if you've been listening, we've talked about vision and what that has, how that is, is related to, to generosity. We've talked about communication. You can have the best, clear, most are easily to articulate vision in the world, but if you can't communicate it, you can't get it out to your people, you're kind of, you're kind of missing the boat there. Uh, we talked about financials and reporting and pastors knowing about what people give and you know if that just kind of made your made your spine stiffen a little bit go back and listen to that one it's a it's a pretty good uh, pretty good uh, explanation of why pastors should know what people give but today I want to talk about discipleship I want to talk about education uh, education is near and dear to my heart um, it's what I was put on this earth to do when Jesus in his ministry uh, he obviously we all know he talked and he, he taught in, in many times in parables and there are 38 parables in the Bible there's only 38 recorded I can't imagine how many he actually taught there's 38 that are written down and of those 38 18 deal with resources and how to manage them. Uh, all of them aren't about money but they're about resources and how we should handle them that's that's Jesus giving you advice on how to handle your resources, not your financial planner, not your accountant. That's Jesus giving you advice on how to handle the resources that God has given you to manage. That's, I think I made my point. Yes, Marshall? That's Jesus giving that advice. Yes, Jesus you did. obviously knew the whole money could have over us. So why in the world would he, would he have talked about it as much as he did if he didn't know that it was a big deal in our lives. I mean, he only had three years. He only had three years, and in those three years, he spent half of his time, or at least what was recorded, half of his time teaching us how to handle resources. Obviously, it was a big deal. He knew the, what the, the hold that culture can have on us. Uh, it was culture was powerful then, and culture is powerful now. And the church is constantly trying to to battle the culture, uh, and and there's a there's a struggle there. And I don't know that I don't know that that struggle is ever going to go away. It, it didn't go away in Jesus's time, and it's I don't think it's going to go away in our in our lifetime. The culture, our culture in today's world in the United States of America is relentless with its message about money. Uh, I get bombarded and I'm sure you do too Marshall and I'm sure everybody who's listening I get bombarded with opportunities in the mail and through email on how to not manage my money well by giving me opportunities to go into debt with a credit card or a line of credit or something along those lines you know if you spend a hundred dollars you get ten dollars off I love those coupons um, you know so you got to spend a hundred bucks you really only need to spend Twenty-five dollars, but you go ahead and spend a hundred to save ten, and you wind up spending ninety dollars. That doesn't make any sense. The culture is relentless with its message about money, and so my question is: Should the church be relentless with the Bible's message about money? Uh, that's, uh, Marshall. I'm, is that a duh question? It is um, a duh question. <laughs> um, you know, duh. Uh, but but are we? You know, are we relentless? And unfortunately, the answer to that is no, uh, we are not. Should we be? I firmly believe we should be. Are we? No, we are not. Dave Ramsey talks about getting out of debt with gazelle-like intensity. I am a Dave Ramsey fan, um, and I've, I've been through his class, and I, uh, you know, they've got a new version out now, a nine-week version. I'm a big fan. Uh, but he talks about getting out of debt. A lot of people are not serious about getting out of debt. And in one of his videos, he shows a gazelle just kind of on the uh, on the African plain, just kind of you know, kind of lollygagging around, just kind of grazing and you know, kind of running. But then he switches to another picture, and it shows it shows that same or a similar gazelle running for its life because it has some type of cat chasing it. Um, and, and there's a big, big difference in jogging and sprinting for your life. And he, he is so passionate about helping people get out of debt that he wants people to have the same gazelle-like intensity as it, as it is with, as he is with getting out of debt. And so my question is, do we 
have that gazelle-like intensity when it comes to teaching generosity to our people? Are we as passionate about teaching generosity as we are about teaching grace and love and forgiveness and mercy and kindness and the heaven and hell and all those kinds of things? And you say, well, you know that, you know, the, Alan. There's more. There's more to the Bible. There's more to teaching people than just talking about money. I totally agree. Jesus spent half of his parables teaching us about resources and how to take care of them. If it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. And we don't, for whatever reason, we feel like we can justify it away. We can explain away our responsibility to teach our people about generosity, and I don't have any patience for that, Marshall. Um, I am a teacher. Education is the only lasting way to modify behavior. The, we can modify behavior in a variety of ways, but the only way that it's going to last and truly be heartfelt is to educate someone. Yeah, you can beat people into submission, uh, but I don't think we want to beat people into, into understanding what giving is all about. That, that's not what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about being intense and being passionate about teaching generosity, I'm not telling people that they've they got to give or they're going to they're gonna go to you know where. That's not what I'm talking about. But we, we need to have the passion to teach and to show and to model generosity. What does a generous lifestyle look like? Let's, let's teach our people what it looks like. Maya Angelou has a quote that I came across and it took me a minute, I had to read it several times to truly get the understanding, but it, when you read education helps one's case cease being intimidated by strange situations. I'm a, I'm a basketball and baseball coach, I'm coaching my 12 year old son, his basketball team and, and we the other day in our game we were being pressed, the, the t other team was pressing us, full court pressing us, trying to put pressure on us. And, and our, uh, our, our boys were intimidated. Um, obviously we have not been uh, educating our players well enough to know how to handle uh, the pressure because they were intimidated. It, it, it certainly looked like that that press was a strange situation for them. Even though we've practiced it several times, it, it, it certainly, the way we handled it certainly looked like a strange situation. It was not pretty. Um, we tend to get a little quiet when it comes to teaching on giving. We, we, you know, we, we kind of we lose that intensity a little bit. And there's a variety of reasons of why that happens, and that's another, another, another session for another day. But, but we tend to get a little bit quiet. So my question is this, is teaching on generous giving a strange situation for your church? Going back to Maya Angelou's quote, uh, are we intimidated uh, by teaching on generosity? And if we are, then it's probably because you're not, it's not normal. We talk about, at Generis, we talk about normalizing the conversation as it pertains to generosity. We want that to be a normal situation in churches not a strange situation in churches. And the best way to do it is to talk about it, have a strategy, and teach. Teach, teach, teach. A child educated at school, only at school, is an uneducated child. Um, I believe that you know, teaching about generosity and uh, among many, many other things begins in the home. Um, it should start in the home. There's no doubt about it. Uh, my children, you know, are being taught by me and my wife uh, about we, we've been trying to model that our not only our giving behavior, our, our all of our, our life behaviors to our children. I think any parent does that. Um, so should it start in the home? Absolutely, it should start in the home. But so that begs the question: What is the church's role? Well, I'm the grown-up, and my wife, or we're the grown-ups in our home. If we have not been taught about giving. How can we teach our children about giving? Now, my wife and I were blessed to grow up in Christian homes, and, and our parents gave. Um, and so we, we saw our parents give, and so we learned our behavior from our parents. But there's a lot of people who are my age, and Marshall, your age, and whatever, uh, that did not grow up in those homes. So where do we learn the behavior? If the, right now, in most churches, their, their people learn their giving patterns from the culture because they're not being taught in their church. So what is the church's role? Um, is it the church's role to teach and model biblical stewardship? 
Um, I'm going to go on the assumption, Marshall, that that's another duh question. Yes, um, it is. <laughs> you know, uh, you know that duh. You know, so if so, who in the who in the church should take the lead? Who should be the leader of this generosity? Uh, teaching and, and passion and game plan in the church, and I'm hoping that that's another duh question. Um, if not you, pastor, then who? Um, if you are a senior pastor and you are listening to this, you are the chief financial officer of your church. It, you cannot you cannot delegate that responsibility. You, there are there are many things that you can delegate, but you cannot delegate the teaching, passionate teaching of biblical generosity to your people. You cannot pass that up. Um, it, it, it lies squarely on your shoulders. Um, so my question then is how often should a pastor preach or teach on generosity? Here, here's a minimum. I think we think that you should teach at least two series per year on generosity. If you are a series pastor, then you should teach at least two on generosity, and one of those has to be on financial generosity. One of my pet peeves is we teach a, we teach a, a series on gener. How many times, Pastor, have you taught on generosity? Well, I taught two series last year. Tell me about them. Well, you know, I had a four week series. We taught on time and talent and prayer and 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 treasure. Being generous with all of those. I think that's beautiful. What did you do in your other series? Well, we taught on time and talent and and you know and and, and prayer and and our treasure and I, and Okay, to me that goes back to kind of being silent, being quiet around the topic of giving. One of them has to be on financial generosity, a minimum of a four-week series that strictly deals with being generous with finances. Not all those other components. They're all important, but not the other components. Four weeks, at least four weeks on giving of money. Are you going to irritate some people in your, in your congregation? Yes, sir, you surely are. Um, but you also irritate them when you talk about forgiveness and mercy and, and all those other things. So the way I look at it this way, Marshall, I'm sure you learned this in your ministry. And I learned this as a coach at a very, very young age. There is absolutely no way to please everybody. You can't please everyone. You're trying to please just the Lord. Okay. So you can't please everybody. So if I can't please everybody, then at the end of the day, I'm going to sleep well knowing that I did what God wanted me to do. Yep. So if, to me, because if you don't teach about generosity and I am in your church, you are not pleasing me. And I'm going to be irritated that you are not teaching generosity. So do you want to irritate me, a generous giver in your church, or do you want to irritate the, the people in your church that are not giving? Which person do you want to irritate? That's a good thought. Because you're, you're going to irritate me if you don't teach about generosity to the people of our church. You're going and you're going to hear it about and you're going to hear about it from me too. I will I will send you an email just like the the people, or I will give you a phone call just like the people who will send you emails and give you phone calls that are not giving and are irritated because now you're meddling in their business. Um, so. At the end of the day, you're not going to please both groups. Who do you want to please, a generous giver or a person that's not giving anything? I'm getting a little irritated here just talking about it. Um, I challenge pastors to incorporate generosity into your sermon 52 times a year. You have Churches have one unique advantage, significant advantage over all nonprofits in the, in, in the world, is that you get to see 70% of your investors in person, face to face, they come to you voluntarily 52 times a year. Why in the world would you not take advantage of that opportunity to talk to your investors about giving and how their generosity, how their generosity is, is facilitating life change in, in, their, in your church, in, in other people's lives via your church? Teach generosity 52 times a year. Doesn't mean you got to incorporate financial generosity 52 times a year, but you can find a variety of different ways to talk about it, either in your sermon or prior to the offering. You can talk about generosity 52 times a year. I've challenged a few, a lot of pastors to do this. I've had a few take me up on it, and it's not as difficult as you might think. If you are a pastor, 
you have you have some creative bones in your body. Most of you listening have a lot of creative bones in your body. Be creative. If you're if you if you're passionate about teaching generosity to your people with that gazelle-like intensity, you can teach generosity 52 times a year and incorporate it into your sermons very very easily. It's not as complicated as you think. It also gives the pastor 52 opportunities to model what a generous lifestyle looks like. It doesn't mean that the pastor's up there saying, hey, hey, beating either his or her chest, saying, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. That's not what I'm saying. But it gives you 52 opportunities to teach and to show and to illustrate and to demonstrate what a generous lifestyle looks like. You can do it with staff members. You can do it with people in your church. You can do it with celebrities. You can do it with people that you saw in the news. There's all kinds of ways to model what generosity looks like. And you have 52 unique opportunities every year to do that. I encourage you to do it. But we can't only teach generosity and worship. We've got to do it in other places. Intentional generosity teaching in small group settings, youth and children. We've got to have that strategy, that part of our strategy to teach people in our small group settings, in our educational environments. There, I, I'm a firm believer that there should be at least one church-wide generosity study to coincide with the sermon series. Hmm. So that one sermon series that you're going to be doing this year that teaches for at least four weeks on financial, uh, on financial generosity, try to, try to work it out where your, your adult, all your adult small groups or Sunday school, whatever it is in your church and your youth and your children, all go along with that and do four weeks. You can do sermon notes. There's plenty of good studies out there that, that, you know, that if you want to know about what different studies are, just contact me. I'll be glad to let you know all the different generosity studies that are out there that you could either teach your sermon series off of or you could certainly incorporate into your sermon series. But there's a lot of really, really good stuff, but we've got to be intentional about teaching. You know, add, add all those studies to your small group library or to your Sunday school library. I don't know how things work in your church, but I know in my church, when, uh, when we get through with the series, you know, we're allowed to go pick what we want. Well, most churches would like to, I think, have some kind of say-so or some kind of suggestion to their, to their small group or Sunday school teachers, leaders and Sunday school teachers, hey, what about this study? Not just on money, but all, these, you know, all the different studies. I mean, you know, we've done this one, and, and we think that this would be good for, for, your, for your Sunday school class or for your small group. I would encourage the staff to go through each study. Uh, to model behavior so all the staff members can say, hey, we did, we did the genius of generosity by Chip Ingram. We did the treasure principle by Randy Alcorn. We did it in staff for four weeks or for six weeks <clears throat> in staff meeting, and it was a really, really good study. I think, you're, I think your group would really benefit from this. So we've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to encourage our people and show them that it's okay. Another component, Marshall, is personal finance courses. Um, I mentioned to you earlier about Dave Ramsey and Financial Peace University, and in my opinion, is the finest personal finance course out there. There's plenty of others that do a good job, but if you truly want to help your people get out of debt, Financial Peace University is, is one of the ways to one of the best ways to do it. As I said earlier, people want to give. People don't have a giving problem. People want to give, but unfortunately, there's plenty of people in our churches that can't because of debt. Um, and so our, is it our role to help them get out of debt? Um, uh, I think that we need to offer them options. We need to we need to offer multiple learning options for our people. So, should the church be relentless with the Bible's message about money? Should we be relentless? And again, I think that's a duh question. If you're listening, is your church relentless? Um, do you desire to be relentless? Do you want do you want your people to be to to live the generous life? to live generously, to, to be in that close relationship with God. But, you know, and, and so as I close here, I just want you to remember, people do not have a giving problem. They have a giving to your church problem. Giving to God deepens our relationship with Him. Uh, I will quote Andy Stanley. You may or may not be an Andy Stanley fan, but I will quote Andy Stanley. I heard him say this over 10 years ago, and I still hear him say this to this day. It's a very, very simple statement. Many of you listening probably heard it. When they are taught, they do not apologize at North Point Community Church for teaching on giving. And every time that Andy talks about it, he, st he starts it off with, or very early in the process with this statement. As it pertains to giving, it is not what our church wants from you. It is what we want for you. And it's because he knows and believes it passionately that giving to God deepens 
our relationship with him. The church, God does not need our money. I mean, he gave it to us in the first place. He doesn't need our money, but boy, he sure did create in us a, a desire to give. So teach your people. Teach your people. Um, pastors, leaders, teach your people. Uh, thank you, for Marshall, for the opportunity again. Um, uh, the, my information is on the screen. If anybody listening, if you'd like to track me down and you know debate anything that I've said or or teach me something uh, that I need to add, I would love to hear from you. And if there's any way that I can be of service to you, just track me down. Alan, thank you so much. I'll give this reminder to our listeners, our viewers. If you pause this and scroll down on your computer screen, you'll find two boxes. The first box is for you to ask your question, and the second box is for us to answer your question. So as you have questions for Alan or for myself, if you'll please put those in there, uh, we'll come back and answer them in the box along with that. You'll find a uh, FAQ section on our website that will allow you to, to go through it, scroll down, and you'll find lots of questions and lots of answers to help you develop your generosity game plan for your ministry. Alan, thank you so much for this, and I hope you folks look forward to Part 5, Step 5, which is coming up after this one. This is Marshall Shannon with Ministry Design Training. Thank you for listening and watching.